You make a good point that we always need to remember here. The possibility of a suspension continues to hover over Deshaun Watson under the precedent that was set by Ben Roethlisberger's case in 2010 to the extent the NFL gives a crap about precedent. That's the other side of this wow. because we know from experience the NFL does what it wants, when it wants, how it wants, where it wants, and it doesn't want to be bound by precedent. It doesn't want to be bound by a concept of fairness. It wants to be bound by its assessment of what is expedient and appropriate for that given situation. And it's all PR. How much of a PR hit do we take if we suspend him? How much of a PR hit do we take if we don't suspend him? How much of a PR hit do we take if we suspend him half a season, whole season? You know, it, uh, that, that's, the, that's the dilemma here. And if he doesn't get suspended at all, you're going to have people rightfully say, wait a minute, wait a minute, Calvin Ridley gets booted for a whole year for making a few bets when he wasn't even with the Falcons, when he's in no position to affect the outcome of the game, when he's in no position. He gets a whole year and Deshaun Watson gets nothing. That's the kind of stuff they're going to have to balance, Miles. And the other side of it too, and what they possibly will do, what they possibly will do, they didn't do this with Roethlisberger because there was still a pending civil action filed in Reno, I think, in somewhere in Nevada against Ben Roethlisberger when he got in trouble in Georgia. He got suspended after the situation in Georgia was resolved with no criminal charges. I still believe he, he settled the potential legal claims privately, and that set the stage for the prosecutor to not charge him. But there was still pending litigation in Nevada. The NFL could have waited for that to resolve before issuing punishment, but it didn't. And I say that now because with Antonio Brown, he got suspended in 20, 28 games for other things that he had done. He wasn't suspended in connection with the pending civil action against him for sexual assault. And the NFL took a wait and see approach. The case was settled and he was never scrutinized for that, never punished for that. So what the NFL could do with Deshaun Watson is say, we're not doing anything until these cases are resolved. And that puts extra pressure on Watson to settle them. But if he goes to trial and loses, then he could be facing a suspension from the league based upon what those verdicts say. I, don't you feel like that would be the most pertinent thing for the NFL to do, though, is to wait until the cases are resolved in some way and then decide exactly how they're going to suspend him? At least to me, that feels like the right thing to do and i don't know what exactly the right thing to do is in any situation especially one like this but if you're going to let the legal if you're going to let the criminal indictment you know or not indictment you know play out then shouldn't you also let the civil cases also play out before you make any kind of decision as to what punishment should come from that um that, that makes sense. And uh, I think that you could make the argument for that. And that may be what the NFL does. You know, one thing the NFL has learned, and this may be why the NFL does this. The NFL wants to wait to make a decision until it has no choice but to make a decision. So if there's a way to kick the can, if there's a way to put a pin in this, if there's a way to wait, that's what the NFL does. Remember the whole question of paid leave. Is he going to be right. put on paid leave? Well, if he's not playing, we don't face that issue. So if the Texans are paying him to not play, you never face that issue. If he's not traded to a team that's going to put him on the field, you don't face that issue. So the NFL never had to cross that bridge. There was a hope by the part of the Dolphins and the Panthers who were willing to trade for him last year. The Dolphins wanted all 22 cases to be resolved. There was a hope that he would be allowed to play, but the NFL never tipped its hand because it doesn't act until it has to. That's the other fact we have to consider here. The NFL has learned and has adopted strategically an approach that it won't do anything until it has to. The Antonio Brown precedent may be the thing that tells us what they're going to do is wait to see what happens with the civil cases. I think we figured this out, or at least I think we've predicted how the NFL is likely to handle it, because I think that's the clue, Antonio Brown, and the fact that they didn't make any decision about paid leave for Deshaun Watson uh, at a time when they didn't have to. They won't do anything until they have to. So maybe that's it. And, and look, if he's ultimately exonerated, if he goes to trial and the finding is there's no liability, there was no violation, what, what's, what, what's, what's there to punish him for? Right. He's, he's emerged 
He's emerged from both halves of the criminal justice, or the criminal and civil justice system with no finding of responsibility. What, what, are you, what are you punishing him for at that point? So that's another thing to keep in mind. Uh, if he would, if he'd settle, that's when it becomes problematic. If he settles, mm -hmm. that's an implicit acknowledgement that he did something he shouldn't have done. That's when it maybe gets a little delicate for the NFL. But uh, I, I think that that may be the way that it goes. Here's Deshaun Watson breaking his silence today after the announcement of no criminal charges. It's definitely a, a very emotional uh, moment for me. Uh, I know we're, we're far from being done of, of uh, handling what we need to handle um, on the legal side, but today is definitely a big day, and, and I thank um, my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ for, you know, letting the truth be heard. Um, and I think everyone that was a part of this, of so seeing and hearing both sides, um, and that's what my point and, and my team wanted to do is, is have a fair slate of us telling our side of the story um, and, and letting the conclusion come down to what happened today, and, and that's what the grand jury decided on. So, um, yeah, thank you, and I, I just thank my Lord and Savior for this going to keep fighting to, to, to rebuild my name and rebuild my appearance in the community. And, uh, you know, we're going to continue to, on the legal side, off the field, handle what we need to handle, but also ready to get back on the field, being prepped for that and, and, and ready to go for that. So um, thank my family, all my close supporters that's been behind me this past year. Thank my team that's been behind me and supporting me and keeping me up this past year. And, yeah, uh, I'm going to continue to just – keep pushing forward and, and build my name back to where it was, if not better. That's the most we've heard from Deshaun Watson since all this first came up. And, and look, we, we, we understand why the Fifth Amendment was invoked today. And there was an effort to push the depositions from Friday to Monday. And Tony Busby is stubborn. He's trying to represent his clients. He's trying to leverage Deshaun Watson. Or he's just trying to be a jerk. Plenty of lawyers are jerks gratuitously. They hide behind the idea that you're supposed to be aggressive and zealous to be aggressive and zealous when they don't have to be. I lived that life for a long time, and it wasn't fun because sometimes you're just always fighting, and you're fighting, and you're fighting, and you're fighting. But the bottom line is it was in Deshaun Watson's best interest to not speak until after this is resolved. And I don't know how invoking the Fifth Amendment over and over again is going to potentially affect him in these civil cases because— he said what he said. He invoked the Fifth Amendment. Now he can, I guess he can waive it now that it's over, but uh, it, it could get complicated. And there may be a strategy that Tony Busby was actually trying to employ here. But it was smart to not say anything until the civil cases or criminal cases were over. But the civil cases, Miles, are not going anywhere. And he will have to testify now in those. He will have to answer questions under oath. He will be faced with aggressive interrogation about what he did, why he did it. It will be unpleasant. It will be hostile. And his alternative is to, to settle the case. And that's what I said last March. He needs to just get these cases resolved in a way that is satisfactory to all parties involved. Yeah, I mean, you, you really have been saying that as we've been doing this show now for, you know, over a year. And we've known these things for just about a year that that Desha it's in Deshaun Watson's best interest to get the cases resolved in a way that works for all parties. But I mean, listening to him and say him say like, oh, the truth came out and we wanted to make sure the truth was exposed from both sides and this and that. Like, I don't really think that that's an accurate portrayal of what happened, especially if we're going to say, if we know, I should say, that he was invoking his Fifth Amendment rights, that's not necessarily hearing from both sides and making sure that the truth comes out from that. And when you're talking about a grand jury, you're only hearing from the prosecutor. So uh, that's, that's one thing. And I don't know about, again, the accuracy of what he was saying there. I understand, though, why he's saying what he's saying, especially is now he is in a position to move on with his life professionally in such a way that he can approve a trade to wherever it is that he decides he wants to go, you know, and that provided they're all that team is also providing back the Houston Texans what they want in trade compensation. So I get why you were saying what you're saying, but as I'm listening to it, I'm like, that's not exactly what happened here.
Hi, I'm Mike Tirico, and thanks for watching. Make sure to hit subscribe for the latest news and highlights from NBC Sports.